Ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham, this is X-Plane 11, and the start of a new video series looking at the Felis Boeing 747-200. Before we begin, for full disclosure, I've been part of the beta testing team for this product for around about five months or so. As a result, I haven't paid retail price for the aircraft you see in front of you. But I have spent many hours testing the aircraft and uh, it's been a lot of fun testing it and also quite challenging as well. It's a very uh, detailed model of the 747, especially the flight engineers panel, which can be quite difficult to get to grips with initially. But rest assured that once you've done it once or twice, it's a fairly straightforward aircraft to operate. This video is going to look at the flight engineer setup. I'm going to break the setup into two separate parts. Normally in my first video I'll get the aircraft airborne, but this video we're just going to look at the flight engineer procedures and in the second video we'll do the pilot procedures, get the aircraft off the stand and out climbing towards flight level 100. So this is London Heathrow and we're going to set the aircraft up for a flight over to Phoenix in Arizona. Let's jump inside. So it's all cold and dark, we've got the flight engineer panel here, we've got the pilot panel and the overhead. It's very similar in some respects to the uh, the older 737s, like a combination between the 727 and the 737. If you've flown the FlyJ Sim 727, you should feel right at home on this panel here, because although it's more extensive, it's actually fairly logically laid out, so it shouldn't really be that difficult to get it up and running. The first thing we want to do, though, is get some fuel and passengers on the aircraft. Now we've got this EFB here. I'll show you the options screen. We've got nose wheel steering options. You can put the modern FMS in it if you want the FMC. I prefer to use the traditional uh, Delco carousel inertial navigator. You can make it align quickly. You can set the INS to SIM GPS so you don't have to worry about aligning the INS in flight or uh, updating the INS in flight and uh, all sorts of other stuff. But what we're interested in is loading the aircraft. There's two ways you can do that. There's fast load on here. If you've got like a sim brief plan and you just want to load the values in, you can use fast load. But really what I'm going to do is use the load calculator. Let me just zero out the weights for the passengers and the cargo. And then what we'll do is we'll start adding some passengers. So maybe a full flight is what we're looking for, about 38 tons of people. Or well, maybe we'll reduce that a little bit. Maybe down to about, I don't know, 35 tons. What's important to note is the payload is basically 100 kilos for each passenger. So although you can load cargo into the hold, if it's strictly a passenger aircraft you're flying, you probably don't want to worry about the cargo weight because an 85 kilogram person and a 15 kilogram bag is allowed for in the uh, individual passenger weights. So 300 and 59 passengers and uh, 35.8 uh, uh, tons. Fairly reasonable. Felis has also got the fuel calculator built in here. Again, if you've got sim brief, you can just go straight ahead and load the fuel. But um, for me, this is probably the easier way to do it. It's about 4,800 nautical miles to Phoenix on the way we're going. My desired flight level, well, I'll probably try and get up to, I don't know, probably 380 eventually. This is aware of the step climbs, so you'll not get up to 380 straight away, but uh, we'll put that in anyway. Our alternate distance, probably Las Vegas, is about 300 miles, 20 minutes of taxi fuel, 5% contingency. And that is pretty much us ready to go. It's important to realise this doesn't actually do anything. This is the calculator. We can see the load sheet. You can see the maximum weights on the load sheet and our actual weights. So we're planned to be well under the maximum weight, 368 tons, and uh, 285 tons for landing. I'm using kilograms, of course. But to load the weights, uh, load the passengers and the fuel, we have to go into the refuel and the payload tabs here. So refuel, just tell it use load sheet data, and I want total fuel of 140 tons, let's say. I'm just going to use instant refuel because I think that's just the easiest thing to do. And payload, same thing. Use load sheet data and then instant board and load. So we've got 19 crew, 359 passengers, and our load calculator is ready to go. If you're building a SimBrief profile for the aircraft, 
not sure uh, empty weight there of 177.6 tonnes. Uh, it's one thing that caught me out. If you use the X-Plane menu, it will show you the empty weight. It actually puts a little bit of extra payload on to allow for the galleys and the crew. But once you've done it, it's, it's all basically loaded. We've got the fuel on board and we've got the payload on board. So let's put that onto the load sheet now and we should be good. So let's power up the aircraft. And again, this is something the flight engineer would do. The flight engineer will be there about an hour and a half before the flight and get it all powered up and ready to go. The stuff we've been doing in the EFB is kind of pilot stuff and selling tickets for our flight as well. You know, you, pilots don't get to decide how many passengers they have. They just get told when they turn up at work uh, what their payload is and they decide how much fuel to take, which is basically what we've done today. Before we power the aircraft up, I'm going to make sure that the gear lever is down, make sure the flaps are set to the uh, same position as the flaps are. So my flaps are attracted, flaps zero. I'm going to make sure my transponder is uh, selected to standby. Make sure my weather radar down here is selected to off. You see it on the off detent. Up here on the engineer panel, I'm going to make sure all the galleys are switched off. They're quite high electrical drain, the galleys. We'll have to cycle those on and off a couple of times during the start. I'm also going to make sure the uh, air demand pumps down here, part of the hydraulic system. Make sure all four of those are selected off. And finally, open the fuel jettison panel here and make sure all the switches are selected off. And that's fine. Now we're ready to power up the aircraft. So when the aircraft is on the stand, it's almost certainly going to have ground power connected. Chocks and GPU is what we want. Before we put power onto the aircraft, we need to establish the, the battery power. To do that, I'll make sure the standby switch is selected off, and then I'll check my battery up here. Now, when you see switches like this, these are usually only controlling what's displayed on the cages. So looking at the APU battery and looking at the, uh, the main ship battery, we've got 27 volts and a slight discharge on it. That's fine. So we've checked the meters. Uh, we'll connect the battery which is here. Battery connected. And then we'll have a look at the external power. So same as the battery, before we put any external power on, you see it's ready to go here, but we want to check the frequency and the voltage. So external power one, it's 400 hertz and 115 volts, and the same on external power two. Just a quick check to make sure the galleys are selected off, and then we'll put the uh, number one external power on and number two external power on. We've got two external power hookups and we've got two generators on the APU to service the load the aircraft has. Now that we've got external power on, we're gonna check the standby power. Standby power switch is here. First of all, we'll do manual on. We'll make sure the fuel gauges come on. That tells you you've got standby power and the on lights there. You can see the flags have disappeared from the engine instruments. And having checked the manual switch, go back to off, and then go back to normal and make sure that the standby power comes back on again. Once that's done, there's another couple of switches up here. The radio master bus, essential, and the number two bus goes on as well. Having done that, have a quick check on the APU battery, the essential transformer rectifier, and then back to the battery bus. Last thing we've got to do is the uh, equipment cooling to make sure that's all behaving itself. We don't want the aircraft running on AC power without the equipment cooling working. So make sure that it's gonna detect smoke if there's any avionic smoke and check the blower. Uh, we'll give you the warning light as well. And that's like the initial power up complete. What we could do now is do a quick light check on the system, make sure all the lights work. There's indicator lights test here. We can see all of the, all of the glowing lights. You'll see there's some blanks up here. That's to be expected. But really just a quick scan through to make sure nothing critical is missing. And on the overhead panel, we can do the same thing here. Not so many lights on the overhead. Remember, this is usually stuff that pilots would get involved in. On a 737, all the switches are on the overhead. But uh, on the 747-200, there's a lot on the engineer panel. So we've now got a choice. We can either start up the APU, or if it's cool enough in the cabin, we don't need that air conditioning air, we can do the overhead scan and get the pilot side of things set up. Because we're at Heathrow and it's 15 degrees outside, let's do the uh, overhead scan first of all, and then we'll come back to the panel. 
So we're not going to touch this panel again until we start the APU up. We've got external power established. That's good enough for us just now. On the overhead panel, there's two things we've got to do. First of all, we are going to switch the uh, nav lights on. We're going to switch the local lights on. We're going to switch the uh, inertial navigation system on. That's number one. That's number two. And that's number three. We're going to switch it to the align mode. Whilst we're here, we know we've been fueled up. I'll put the no smoking and the fasten seatbelt signs on. That's one less thing for the flight crew to do when they arrive. We want to get the inertial system aligning. That's one of the, the most important things because it can take quite a while. If you haven't used the carousel before, or you've used the uh, other uh, carousel for X-Plane, or maybe the Simufly INS for the Microsoft series, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It, it works very similar to the, the others, although it's a fully implemented uh, triple carousel system here. Lots of, um, lots of fun switches to push. All that we want to do is come over to the status page. So like a modern FMS, you can choose which information you want to display. You've got these two uh, segment displays here, and you just choose what information you want to show on there. So I want to go around to desired track and status. You can see that when you've got two values, it will show you, for example, distance and time. So distance would be here and time would be here. Desire track and status. Status is on that side. We're looking to make sure there's no error codes in here. Push the test button, make sure all the segments come up and then we'll go back to position and we'll enter the current position. Now there's two ways to do this, to find this position. We can have a look at the INS and we can read it from here, or we can insert it from here. If you want to make it quick, just push the quick align button and it's all good to go. If you want to do it more authentically and you've got a Navigraph subscription or charts for the airfield, bring up your parking stand list and uh, read the coordinates from there. In this case, we're on stand 331, so there's our coordinate system here. It's important if you're using uh, different uh, coordinates to understand that it's uh, degrees, minutes, decimal minutes, rather than degrees, minutes, and seconds. So let's just uh, go right ahead. It's on the position page. I'm going to push the two button, that's north. So you can see I'm going to say north. It starts flashing. And I'm going to type in 51.28.4. 51.28.4. I push insert and then type in the west value. So it's just west. And in this case, I'm just going to type in 278. So west, 0, 0, 0. 278 insert and with that the number one INS is starting to align you can see the other one is uh, doing some other stuff as well go check the status check the lights go back to position and then it's just a case of doing the same thing again north 51 28 4 insert west 278 insert we'll flick it around to the status page you can see this value here, the eight on both of them, that counts down. When it gets down to five, it's ready to navigate. Of course, there's a third INS in this aircraft as well. So let's do the check on that. We come to the status page, we push the test, make sure all the lights come up, go to position. And uh, one more time, it's north 51, 28, four, insert west 278 insert and go around to status. When you're actually entering waypoints into the INS, you can remote the keyboards so that when you push remote on there and remote on there and remote on there, you only need to do the entry on one of them and it will replicate to the other three. But for the initial alignment, you have to do it individually on all three systems. That's really as far as the engineer would go. He'd get the system aligning because you don't want to do data entry for navigation when there's only one pilot on board the aircraft. So let's do the other stuff on the overhead. There is one important check and that's to make sure our performance index here, that number seven that counts down from nine, make sure it's eight or below before we do any of the checks on the overhead. Okay, the overhead scan is very straightforward. First things first, we're gonna turn the window heat on and check it. I'm going to push the power lights button here. This just makes the lights work when the window heat is on. And then we're going to switch them on and make sure that the window heat goes on. And it should go off when the windows go up to temperature. You can actually see the current drain from the external supply here. 
so those should modulate to keep the temperature set appropriately. There's also an overheat test. If I push it, I'm going to hold my left mouse button. I'm going to drag the mouse around and look at the overheat warning light there. Make sure that comes on. It should be as straightforward as that. Once the windows come up to temperature, those lights will go out. We also have to check that the override function works. So make sure you get uh, window heat on the override as well. That would apply a, a constant heating source to the engine uh, to the to the windows. We leave them in the on position, close the covers. And you can see it is kind of flicking them on and off, so that's fine. Power lights can go off. We're basically done with that. That's set and forget. Air temperature probe check. Make sure the light goes off and probes check all the lights go off. Both sides, and that's us done. Nacelle anti-ice and ground wing anti-ice we don't need to worry about just now. Mac airspeed warning. Over rotation warning. Stall warning. Check. All the rest of it is really just a scan through. We're looking down through this column here making sure that the compass is set to slave mode. Because it doesn't have a, a database in the inertial navigation system, it still uses a magnetic detector to send uh, true north. So you've got a traditional compass system, just like a general aviation aircraft. Down here, these are alternate flap selections. Make sure they're all set to off. HF isn't implemented in X-Plane, but if you want to be realistic, you'd set it to upper sideband. Coming through here, we've got the seatbelt signs on. We should probably lock the flight deck door or enable the flight deck door to be locked. We can arm the emergency lights. Before we do that, we put them to on, make sure they would come on in the cabin. That's that's not something that's simulated, so just put it to armed and close the cap. Up here, cockpit voice recorder, we're going to push and hold test and look for a double bounce on this needle here. So there's one, two, the wheel well fire detector, check that. Back down through this column here again, very similar to the other side. Ignition is set off, the compass is set to slaved. The uh, alternate gear extent is all closed. Again, HF or cell call is not simulated in next plane, but normally your cell call would be on HF1 and HF2, upper sideband for the HF. On the last column here, we've got to make sure our body gear steering is armed and make sure the anti-skid is selected on. Body gear steering is important for pushback and for taxi, otherwise the aircraft is very difficult to steer, but you want to make sure that's off when you take off, otherwise it can get exciting. Auto brakes, there's not a rejected takeoff position, so just leave those on off, and everything else on that panel is done. On to pilot's panel, and again, it's the flight engineer that would be doing this check. So we're just going to walk through it in a logical manner. What I have to do is tune an ILS frequency. So something uh, 10915, that seems like a reasonable ILS frequency. Make sure you've got the needles, uh, both the needles there. Put the flight directors on, and then we'll do the up left test. Make sure the needles move up and left and down and right. We'll come across, we'll do the same thing on this side, flight directors on. We'll set uh, another ILS frequency. As long as it's ILS frequency, you get the, the pointers here. Up left, down right. And obviously you're checking on the HSI as you do that as well. Whilst we're interested in the flight instruments, let's check the attitude indicator test and we'll check the RADALT test. You'll notice that when you do the RADALT uh, test, the GPWS in op light comes on. Do the same on this side, there, and there. Having done that, more press to test to worry about just under here. Reset the maximum indications. The altitude alert, we're just going to push that and then spin the altitude down to the current altitude. Make sure you get the alert sound. GPWS test. Pull up. Glide slope. Glide slope. Pull up. And then rudder ratio test. That's just a light you're looking for. Push rudder ratio and the rudder ratio light comes on. There's also the instrument warning test here. You can see this panel here and this panel here. Make sure those light up. And you can also cancel and cancel. Also looking here, there's a press to test. And I, I really do like the way this has been modeled, these rotating displays. I think it's really, really clever. There's press to test and press to test. Likewise, we've got the same over here. Press the test on both. 
looking down here, make sure all these caps are closed. These are like instrument changeover switches, the same as you see on the forward panel on an Airbus. Just sends out the third system, the third INS to the HSI, or changes the compass system, that sort of thing. The flashing brake pressure, uh, don't worry about that just now. Coming across here, you see we do have a little bit of hydraulic pressure, but we'll need to sort that out before we take the chocks out. That's it with the forward panel. If you want to be nice for the captain, you would turn the uh, weather radar range up a little bit as well. And uh, obviously double check that the weather radar is uh, in the off position. We'll put it to standby in just a second. That gets the CRTs warming up on the uh, panels there. We've got to check the config warning on the aircraft as well. That's on the throttles. It's only actually the number three throttle that has this. So grab throttle number three, move it forward and move it aft. Make sure you've got the warning sound from it. Coming down, we could set the radios up as well so the pilots don't have to worry about it when we get there. VHF1, VHF2 probably turned down a little bit. Just squeeze the PA up so pilots can hear what's going on in the cabin. We've got the weather radar we have to set to standby. We'll put the tilt up and that gets all the electronics warming up there. This panel here is probably the most important panel on the pedestal because this is the auto thrust control. On a modern aircraft, you're used to the auto thrust being up here, but it's kind of split between the on switch and the speed selector and the mode selector down here. If I push test, be aware of this instrument here. This is your rating panel here. Okay, if I push test and I hold the mouse, you can see it rates to take off and you can see the EPRA value increase. And basically, there's a list in the manual to check those, but really all we're making sure is that the uh, EPR limits move, and then we'll set it back to take off dry. Some of these aircraft had a water injection system. That was why you've got take off dry and take off wet, but the water injection system isn't simulated on this model, and indeed not all of them had it. This is your rudder trim. You can see the index down here. Just make sure the rudder trim is in the middle and uh, aileron trim, you've got a control uh, repeater up here. So that should be the pilot checks finished. Now what we've got to do is start up the APU and do the flight engineer checks to finish off the preparation. So on the engineer panel, it looks very complicated, but there's a fairly logical flow to it. Okay, we've got external AC power on at the moment. That means that we can start the APU using uh, the fuel pump uh, down here. On the 737, the uh, fuel pump, you'd have to select the fuel pump on manually. But on the 747, it does it all by itself for you. So if I flick the APU switch from stop to on, you'll see that the pressure light goes off here. So although this aft pump is selected off, it is running because the APU demands it. We can do the squib test, fire test A, fire test B, fault test A, fault test B, and there's also a dual check just in the middle there. Having done that, we can start the APU. Once the APU is up and running, we're going to establish electrical power and then pneumatic power or air pressure. So APU comes up to speed. Now, remember what I said before, when I put the external AC part on, we don't want to connect any source of electricity to the aircraft without checking the frequency and the current. And it's the same for the APU generators. So there's APU generator number one, and you'll notice there's no voltage. That's because up here, the fields are selected, or the fields are closed. Uh, sorry, the field trips are open. So I'm gonna close the field trips the lights go off and now I've got voltage showing. That means the generator is making electricity, but it's not yet connected to the aircraft. Check generators one and two and make sure they're 400 Hertz, 115 volts. And because they're good, now I can connect them to the aircraft. You see doing that, it trips the external AC power off. So external AC is now not being used. Because we're on internal power, we'll put the galley power on so the cabin crew can get the meals and tea and coffee heating up. We'll put the galley fans to auto and the galley chillers on. It increases the load a little bit, but really the galley is the big draw there. That's the electrical power. 
we've also got to get APU air into the system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the isolation valves here on the pressurization system, on the bleed system. You see the air from the APU flows up here towards those isolation valves and then the meter is kind of tapped off at this point. It's a visual schematic of what's going on. With those valves closed, bleed air comes on and then we'll open the left hand isolation valve and make sure I get good pressure. So it's above uh, 30 PSI and then on the right hand side as well. That's air pressure coming into the system. We probably want to run the air conditioning as well to cool the cabin down a little bit. So make sure all the pack controls are selected to auto. And up here we can choose what these, um, what these six gauges are looking at. So this switch here, it doesn't control anything, it just controls, it just changes what's indicated on these dials. Obviously when it's all electronic you can have a little bit more information and a lot less space. In this case these gauges are just recycled so you've got three switches and six gauges you know, rather than having 18 gauges. So pack one, we're going to switch the pack on, open the pack flow valve, check the temperature from the air cycle machine, check the airflow. One, two, I think I did two at the same time, and three, there we go. Excellent. With the packs on, we can also run the recirculating fans. That just takes some air from the cabin and pushes it back into the pressurization system. And we can also put the gasper fan on, that's little vents above your head. And finally, trim air. We'll put the trim air on. Now the reason for the trim air is you've got three packs on here. And you can control the pack temperatures, but you've got five temperature zones. You've got the uh, upper deck and the four main zones. If you want to change the temperatures throughout the cabin, rather than having to adjust the pack temps, what the trim air does is put a little bit of hot air in. So the packs cool the air down to, uh, let's say, 10 degrees, for example, uh, 10 degrees Celsius, and then the trim air system increases the, the temperature a little bit. Okay, actually it's putting out, what, 25 at the moment. So you'll see that temperature come down, and then you'll see the uh, compartment temperatures and the temperature stabilise when the temperatures come up. Cool, that's almost as done for the pneumatic system, uh, the pressurization system. The last few things we want to check is the initial cruise altitude is set on here. We're going to go up to, I don't know, flight level 300, so we set it a 1,000 feet above, flight level 310, and then we need to check the outflow valves. Now, normally you'd be doing this on the stand with the cabin doors open. We don't have that ability to simulate that in the model at the moment. So as I change the outflow valves, you'll see the cabin vertical speed change. That wouldn't happen in the real thing if the doors were open, because you can't pressurise the cabin when the doors open. You might see it fluctuate, but you wouldn't see it change dramatically. So let's go to manual mode, and I'll just make sure that I can run the valves. Make sure they close fully. And make sure they open fully. And again, you can see that BS. Let's not worry about that just now. We'll do the same with the right valve. All the way closed, all the way open. And then what we have to do is a rate limit check. Now, what those outflow valves do, as you can tell from the name, is they let air out of the cabin. That's how you regulate the pressurization. If there was to be a failure of one of the windows or the doors or one of the seals on the aircraft that lets air escape anyway, the last thing you want is the outflow valves helping that air to escape. So the rate limit system is if it detects an excessive cabin rate of climb, it will close the outflow valves and we need to test that. Now on the real aircraft, you've got two hands. I only have one mouse cursor, so this gets a bit tricky. I'm going to push rate limit. I'm going to make sure the light comes on and the valves close. I'm going to release the switch and go to manual mode and make sure that gives me manual control of the valves. I'm going to switch it to manual left Make sure the right valve closes on auto and manual right. Make sure the left valve closes on auto. And one more time, rate limit, release it and verify it goes back to normal. So you're making sure the cabin uh, pressurization system is able to cope with any potential emergencies in the system there. From this point onwards, it's kind of a, a 
bigger S uh, scan through the panel to, to get everything up and running. So we've done the uh, APU, we've done the pressurization all here. We've just got some more checks to do up here. So the engine fire system, we'll do the squib test left, squib test right, and then we'll do the fire test A. So you see the A side of the main cell temperature warning goes up. You don't get any fire bells of that. Same for the B test. But when you do them together, you get the fire lights and the bell. Same with the fault. A fault, B fault, both together, you get the bells. Excellent. So that's the squib tests, uh, the engine nacelle fire protection system done. We've done the equipment cooling already, so it's half cargo heat we can test. We've got the lower cargo fire protection. Again, no surprises now. Test A, test B, test both with the fire bells. Script test bottle 1 and bottle 2. Wing leading edge overheat, test 1, test 2. So you see there's quite a bit of uh, testing functionality on this aircraft. I think it's important to remember this aircraft comes from a time when travelling wasn't quite as common as it is these days. Uh, even in the 90s, the, the amount of long-haul travel we had in the 90s wasn't quite the same as what we had pre-pandemic, certainly. Um, there's a little bit more ceremony getting this aircraft ready to go, and I think that reflects the time it comes from. It is actually fairly straightforward if you just start up the APU, start the air conditioning system, put the fuel pumps on, you're ready for engine start, more or less. But, you know, I quite like the ceremony, ceremony with it. Brake temperature monitors are here. Uh, we'll put the test mode on, make sure all the brakes come up to overheat. So left front, right front, left rear, right rear. Test mode off and make sure we get sensible indications. We can do the lamp test on the data recorder here. We can check the uh, land gear tilt inputs both ways. We can check the gear lights system primary and secondary, the tilt sensors primary and secondary, and the doors primary and secondary. The doors shouldn't be open at the moment, that's fine. Bottle water, press the test. The Jetson panel, we've already checked out. Um, the leading edge devices we don't have to worry about just now. It brings us neatly onto the fuel system. Now, we know from our fueling, if I look at my load sheet on here, We've got a block fuel of 139.5 tonnes, and that is what we've got set on here. If you fueled it manually, you've messed around with the fuel, you can adjust the um, total weight, but you can't adjust the fuel. The fuel is set uh, from the... Or fuel is read from the system, but you have to set the gross weight. So looking on here, you've got a takeoff weight of 351, almost 352 tonnes, and we've got about 800 kilos for taxi, so 352.8, 352.7. It's as close as makes no difference. Half a tonne on an aircraft this size is fine. At that point onwards, we'll check the gauges on the fuel system, so push and hold the rest of the test here. You've got error zero, error four, and all the segments, and then it will cycle through. So just making sure the fuel gauges behave correctly. Reset fuel used on these uh, instruments here. Fuel temperature we don't need to worry about just now, but we can click the fuel heat to on. That'll, uh, that's like a momentary test position. On. Make sure those lights come on and go off again. And then we've got the most important part of the fuel system. The crossfeed valves and the fuel pumps. These are what we'll have to use to manage fuel as we continue across the Atlantic. Let's check the crossfeed valves, first of all, and the reserve valves. So this is a picture of what the valves are doing. This valve is cross-line, and this valve is in-line. You can see the line drawn over the top of it. So this is allowing flow, and this is preventing flow. When these lights come on, the valve is not in the commanded position. So at the moment the valve is closed, and the light is off, or the valve is cross-line, the light is off, so we know it's where it's supposed to be. So all I do is put it in-line, Make sure the light comes on and goes off, and then cycle it back to cross line. And we do that with all of the fuel valves, because these fuel valves are important for making sure all the fuel gets to all the engines. We'll cycle all of them. Make sure in each case the light goes on and the light comes off. 
and we want to leave it in the state the aircraft started up. We want the reserve valves closed on both sides. We want crossfeed number one and number four open and number two and number three closed. And that, it doesn't matter whether or not the uh, center tank is full or not at this point. We're not going to take off with the center tanks feeding all of the engines. So one and four in line, two and three cross line. We have to check the boost pumps as well. So we'll put the, the left set of switches on, make sure all the press lights come on. But most importantly, make sure the other pressure light uh, stays on when these ones go off. That's making sure these check valves are working in the correct sense. The, pressure, the check valves haven't failed. Obviously, it's not possible to do for this one because although it's selected off here, this pump is running for the APU. We don't need to worry about that too much. Swap the pumps over. So it's now the right and the aft pumps that are running. And again, check for those pressure lights off and on as you'd expect. And then switch all of the pumps on. Very nearly there now. Moving across. These are the engine instruments, and this is really what the flight engineer is, is going to be monitoring during the flight. We're looking at the oil quantity on here, and we're looking at the temperature of the oil. So the engines aren't too cold, just about zero degrees, and there's plenty of oil in there. Foster interest in fluids. The one that we've missed is the hydraulic system. It's over here. And we're looking for a quantity check on the hydraulics, make sure the needles move. Make sure you get the low quantity warning lights and then make sure the quantities are in the green bands, which is what you're expecting. 747 has got a very interesting hydraulic system. It's very straightforward and very easy to understand. We've got an electrical pump for system four. We've also got an air pump for system four and an engine pump for system four. System one's got air pump, engine pump, as has system two and system three. Some aircraft have the number one system with an electric pump as well. So you've got between nine and 10 hydraulic pumps on the aircraft. We're gonna leave these all selected off at the moment, but we do need to run the air pumps before we push the aircraft back off the stand. With that, that is the flight engineer set up complete. The aircraft is ready for the pilots to come on board and load the aircraft navigation system, load the aircraft, uh, set up the the VORs, the NDBs, calculate aircraft performance and push back off the stand and get airborne. And we'll pick that up in the next video. I hope you join me for that. Thanks very much.